Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, happy to be here amongst all of you today. And I'll speak today on the topic of curses and choices. So basically, we'll talk about how sometimes some situations can come like curses in our lives. And even in those situations, we have some choices. And I'll talk about three factors that can empower us or that shape our choices and how we can choose wisely. Now firstly, what exactly is a curse? Now if you see, we use the word curse, like some people say, don't, don't, don't say speak curses. Like say if children associate with some, some, they get some bad association, they may use some foul words. Those are curse words we say. So now, we sometimes use foul words as curse words, but along with that, in the past if we see when somebody curses, then what happens? You turn into a stone or Naradhani curses, you become a tree. So what is happening over there? You know, somebody speaks some words and suddenly like in the Rama it is said that Gautam Rishi cursed Ahalya and she became a stone or Nalakura and Manigri in the Bhagavatam is described is cursed. And they turned into what? Trees. So what's happening over here? Actually, the idea is that based on one's position, one's words become triggers for higher power. Just like if somebody is a commander of an army or somebody is a judge and the judge says let this person be hanged now the judge because of the position and the power of the judge what happens those words activates a mechanism and that mechanism is the penal system of the government by which that person will be sent to the electric chair or whatever is the way to be executed so this is called as performative utterance. The utterance leads to the performance of an action. And that combination of utterance and performance, that is because of the power of a person. So if an ordinary person says to another person, let may you be hanged. Well, there is utterance, but there is no performance. Or the utterance alone will be the performance. <laughs> Nothing else will happen after that. So the idea is that now we can see in today's world, say if a boss tells an employee, you are fired. Now what is happening? If that boss has that power, then those words you are fired lead to certain actions. Now in these cases, we can see things more analytically that there is an utterance and then there is a mechanism and by that mechanism that utterance transforms into a performance. But in the past, there were people who had higher powers, mystic powers. And when they had mystic powers, then what would happen because of that? The mechanism that would be activated would be much subtler and much faster. So Narad Muni just says, may you turn into a tree. And that utterance and the performance happens almost instantaneously. Because Narad Muni is a great sage and he has great powers. But the point here is, you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Does that mean saying a good thing could be a curse? Because if you say a good thing, then some good thing will happen later. So how will that? You, may you be blessed and then great things happen to the person. Yeah, so if uh, definitely, yes, good point. Yeah, words, words can be performed in the both senses. Suppose, say, somebody has been wrongly, uh, wrongly charged of some accusation and then the judge says, you know, may this person be compensated with $10,000. Then they get those $10,000. So, performative utterances can be both ways, curses as well as blessings. Oh, so it isn't a curse if it's good. Yeah, of course, it's not a, it's not a curse then, yes. So, basically, we are talking about the power of words. Now, 
many people can utter curse words, but in Kali Yuga, very few people can actually curse. And that is a great blessing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have so such short tempers. If we started cursing each other, and our curses started having effects, <laughs> things would be terrible for everyone. As it is, in our tongue, nowadays there is a lot of concern that uh, people have, some people have guns and they may just use the guns to shoot indiscriminately. In schools there is fear. So, now if somebody has a gun, they have to be extremely careful how they use that gun. So now we may not be carrying guns physically with us, but all of us have a gun inside us. And that is our tongue. And this gun of the tongue is constantly loaded. <laughs> and at any moment, it can just shoot. It can fire. And we, if we are not careful, so that's why, uh, then we can hurt people tremendously. Now, as it is, words can hurt, even if the words don't lead to any performance. But if words were to lead to performance, the hurt could be so much more. So the principle of curses, as it is there in the tradition, was that a person who judges that somebody else has done something wrong, then they utter a curse and their utterance leads invoke some higher powers by which whatever they have uttered becomes transformed into an action. And sometimes sages, they may have such power to give curses, but many times curse, they themselves cannot withdraw the curses. Just like we say words, once they are spoken, they cannot be unspoken. We cannot withdraw the words once they go out. We can apologize, we can qualify, we can do various things, but the words just be short. So actually, to have power is not always a pleasure. To have power can also be a lot of trouble at times. More trouble for ourselves as well as for others. So at one side, somebody, is, somebody can have the power to curse. Now, along with the power to curse, there is also the power to choose. Choose means, when I am angry, do I curse someone or do I not curse someone? So, at that time, that choice is there for the curser as well as for the cursed. Because even when somebody is cursed, it is not that everything is lost. So, what are the prominent curses in the Ramayana that you can think of? There are at least five prominent curses which shape the storyline of the Ramayana. Can you think of those curses? Shravan, curse into yeah, yeah, Shravan cursed Dashrath. What are the curse? You will die. You will, uh, you will feel the separation from your child and yeah. that pain you will die. Yes, just as you have caused me to die in separation from my son, you will die in separation from that, your son. Yes, that's one. Anything else? Hanuman was cursed that he will forget his power. Yes, Hanuman was cursed. Now, of course, there are different kinds of curses. And we could say at one level, uh, all curses are ultimately meant to benefit the person only, if they have done something wrong. In the case of Hanuman, they knew that Hanuman was not a bad person, but he was bad, not a bad child, but he was having powers. So sometimes if children do a lot of mischief, then the parents may ground their child. No, no toys for you, no phone for you, no TV for you. Hey, what do I do? Think of the mistake that you have done. So now, now, external facilities can be taken away relatively easily. But for Hanuman, he did not need any external facilities because internal powers only he had. And the powers were given by the gods. So they couldn't do anything about that. They couldn't take away the powers also. So what they took away was the remembrance of those powers. That's a good example. Second. Any other examples of curses in the Ramayana? Uh, Ahilya, Ahilya. Yeah, Ahilya. I'll come to that towards the end. I will move on. Any other? Sorry? Yeah, Wali was cursed for what? Yes. 
the Rishayamukh mountain where Sugriva found shelter. Wali could not enter over there because he once in a great anger had thrown the corpse of a demon, Dundubi. And while he had thrown the corpse after killing the demon, the blood had, uh, had spilled in the sacrificial arena of a sage over there, Matang Rishi, and that sage had cursed. One of the main characters, he had a curse. Ravana? In the, yes. Ravana. What was the curse for Ravan? He, he won't be able to touch any woman without uh, her permission. Yeah, he couldn't, couldn't violate a woman. And uh, that was a curse which, which actually ensured that Sita remained pure throughout. Yeah. Although she was with Ravan. So, you had something more? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, if you use the word curse in a general sense to say some limitation on ability to do something, that will apply there. Yes, that's true. Thank you. So, yes, you remember the Ramayana quite in details. Huh? <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, now when in each of these curses, we see that there is something which somebody has done wrong, and then there is a result of that curse. And that curse, basically, what does a curse do? Essentially, see, we all have a some kshetra. Kshetra is area on which we have some influence. And a curse restricts that area. For Wali, it was a physical restriction. You cannot go in this area. For Dashrath, it was a restriction in terms of time duration. You will get, in, you will get into the situation. And that's why. For Ravan, also it is a restriction in what activity he could do. For Hanuman, it was in what powers he could have. Now, among all the curses, the curse to Ahalya seems the most immobilizing. The, the most, uh, she was just turned to what? Stone. Stone. Stone you know, it's like terrible. So, <clears throat> somebody recently sent me a link to a video. It was titled something like, like a, it was Ahalya's Revenge. And what is it? This video, basically what they showed was that there is a beautiful woman who is, some man comes to visit her house and this woman is married to a relatively older man. And then whoever tries to unite with this woman, that man turns into stone. Not just into stone, she turns into a, like a doll. So, and in her drawing room, she has a, a collection of dolls. So is this a well-known thing? Okay, anyway. So anyway, so they said that this is Ahalya's revenge. But now, this is, in the normal storyline of Ahalya, there is something very significant which is missed out. So, the broad story is that Ram went to the forest twice. Does anyone know how twice? Vishwamitra. And second? Exile. After being exiled, yes. So, in first he had gone. So, he had, he went to the forest and one, his various pastimes, Kaushika Makasam Rakshak Rama. He protected the sacrifice of Kaushika. And then, as he went towards Mithila Purajan Mohak Rama. So, you can repeat these names after me. Mithila Purajan Mohak Rama. Mithila Purajan Mohak Rama. So, Mithila Pura, the city of Mithila, Jana, the people Mohak. He attracted them, charmed them. So, between these two pastimes, living Vishwamitra's ashram and going towards the ash going towards janak janakpuri in between this pastime happens so what happens is gautam muni sampujit rama 
तम मुनि संपूजित रामा श्रीमद अहल्योद्धारक रामा अहल्योद्धारक रामा सो एज राम वॉज गोइंग थ्रू द फॉरेस्ट ही मेट गौतम मुनि एंड देन ही वेंट फर्दर एंड दे केम टू अ हर्मिटेज विच लुक डेजर्टेड बट इट हैड it was it was it, it was looking suitable for hab- habitation but nobody was living over there and and ram asked what is this what is this place and then he told the story now so this is a story he said of cheating and curses so ahalya was a very attractive young woman and when she was young even the gods wanted her hand in marriage but she uh, was married to gautam rishi and after the marriage then the gods decided okay this desire can't be fulfilled they let go uh, but there is one god who always gets into trouble <laughs> who is that indra so indra still had so much desire that he was looking for an opportunity and when gautam muni went out to the river to take a bath he took on the form of indra and he came there and then he Uh, went into the hermitage to the cottage and he united with the halya and then when he came out at that time gautam muni was coming back and gautam muni was coming back and he saw first he saw this look alike it's quite a shock suddenly if you see someone who looks exactly like you but then he had mystic power so he immediately understood this indra what is he doing over here and as soon as he realized what has happened he got so angry he says you you sinful person may be cursed and he was grievously deformed because of that curse and then an ahalya heard her husband's angry voice she came running out and she realized that he's angry and is committed to receive sought forgiveness but he was angry he says you have become stone hearted may you become like a stone now in this story line ahalya seems to be simply a victim first of basically a victim of two men indra's lust and gautam muni's anger but there is a significant point which the valmiki ramayan clearly mentions but most retellings of the story most popular retellings don't tell that see ahalya was also not an ordinary woman not only was she beautiful but she was also a wise woman she was a powerful woman so when indra came there although he impersonated as gautam rishi Ahalya recognized that was Indra. Ahalya recognized this was not my husband. But at that time, she felt so heady, so intoxicated that I am so attractive that the king of the gods is going to so much efforts to be with me. So you know, our lower desires allure us in different ways. so of course these are general statements but broadly speaking what happens is the male psychology is such that men desire women and the female psychology is such that women desire the desire of men so the psychology works differently lust allures men with pleasure lust allures women with power that means that a woman oh i am so attractive such a powerful man is going to so much lengths to come to me and that's why traditionally if you see whenever there is regulation there are regulation in both ways so whatever is a particular temptation for us we need to resist that so that heady sense of power which she got now that doesn't make her a evil person it is just one moment of weakness and each all of us can have moments of weakness in which we succumb and we do something wrong so that definitely doesn't make her evil but the point is she is not just a victim at the very least she is a consenter over there so what happened over there basically was gautam muni he didn't just curse her because she united with indra because he also had mystic power and he understood immediately that ahalya also consented to that so basically what happens for each one of us our consciousness it by every choice 
it either expands or it contracts. Every action that we do, say if there is a small boy who is born in the butcher's family, and initially when they see, when the child goes to his father's place and he sees the father cutting animals, it is a brutal sight. And sometimes people say that, oh, you know, what is the difference between eating vegetarian food and non vegetarian food? Ultimately, we non vegetarian people kill animals, you kill plants. What is the difference? Is there a difference? What do you think? Yes? Why is there a difference? Bad souls who are punished to stand forever, or at least for a very long time. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 I, you know, I. You can assist what? you with philosophy. <laughs> 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 See, the point you're making is right. Uh, the reasoning, however, is a little suspect. What's happening is, yeah, I'll come back to you. Yes. Yeah, you are on the right side. Yeah, you are saying something? Lower consciousness. Yeah. So, yes, say you could say, see, this is, I gave a whole class on this principle. I will come to this point again. About this point about plants being, pun uh, plants being bad souls who have been punished. See, we are not meant to deal with people based on their past karma. Like, I was at one program, and some devotee had, before me had come there and given a class how now, those who slaughter cows will become cows in the next life. So then this boy was asking me his question. He says, does that mean all cows were cow slaughterers in the past? <laughs> <laughs> so now this is, a, this is a standard error in logic. It's called the error of the antecedent. What does error of the antecedent means? That if A leads to B, that does not necessarily mean that if B, then A. So, for example, if we say if it rains, the pavement outside our house will be wet. So, tomorrow morning, if I go and see the pavement wet, does that mean it was a, a rain? Not necessarily, isn't it? It could be that there is some leakage somewhere. It could be that somebody has uh, watered the garden and some water has come out of the lawn. Somebody, somebody is carrying a bucket and got spilled. So, unless you know that A is the only cause of B. You can't say that if B, then A. So, now how a soul becomes a cow, we don't know that. Is it the only trajectory that slaughterers become cows? No, there can be different trajectories. And basically, we are not meant to judge people based on their past lives, on this life. But at the point you said our lower consciousness, and even from a scientific perspective, the nervous system of the plants is developed much lesser than of animals. So, they feel less pain. The principle in karma is that when we living in the world, we can't avoid causing pain. But let us cause as less pain as possible. You know, if you say, I will not cause any pain, well, if you want to see, we can, we always need to see things in the most constructive frame of reference. If you, if you change the frame of reference, Anything can be distorted. You could say that a doctor is a cold blooded murderer of germs. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Precisely knows, okay, this germ, this medicine will kill. So, complete planning, cold blooded. <laughs> Why do you want to look like that? No, that is not a constructive frame of reference. The world is a tough place where uh, we all have to jivo, jiva se jivan, as the Bhagavatam says. One life has to live on another life. But the idea is cause as less pain as possible. So, certainly animals suffer much, much more pain than plants. But another simple, even if I am going to science, a simple reasoning. Even if somebody is a non vegetarian, regular non vegetarian, if their school, if their child comes from school and says, 
oh mom or oh, dad our school is arranging a expedition we want to go to a field to see harvesting most parents no pa no parent will have an objection yeah go and see harvesting but the same child comes as and says my school has organized an exped field expedition to a slaughterhouse to see animals being slaughtered how many parents would allow in america at least parents would sue the court <laughs> sue the school itself you know what kind of things you are showing to our children isn't it so we all intuitively know there's a difference in gradation but the point i was making here is about why alia was cursed to be a stone what is the significance of that i was saying that our consciousness is shaped by our actions so initially even a butcher's child knows this, this is living and we are killing it we shouldn't kill it so we shouldn't kill it i was in hawaii recently and i met one devotee couple so they were from uh, the mata ji was from uh, one of the russian states ussr state so she said that you know their family profession was that they would catch crabs and then they had a hotel where they would serve crabs and crabs are probably crabs and one more animal they are the only animals which are actually cooked alive if you don't cut them you cook them alive so it's it's when i came to krishna consciousness i realized what have i been doing you know causing so much pain just completely gave it up for that so basically because it is just being done habitually she was desensitized to it but as soon as she became aware but i can't do this so basically our consciousness is affected by our choices so when a person goes first time to a slaughter house and a child of the son of a slaughterer goes say and their hand will tremble i can't do this but one time they do it second time do it third time do it then they do it nonchalant eventually slaughterers make cut chicken like they are cutting sabji nonchalantly completely so what happens our consciousness gets diminished 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 so every choice can either elevate our consciousness or shrink our consciousness by, by elevate means when our consciousness is elevated we perceive the pain of others when our consciousness is shrunk we can perceive only our pleasure this thing will give me this pleasure what it is costing others i don't care that's the difference so now <clears throat> what happened was when ahalya she knew that this is indra but she chose not to think about her husband not to think about her husband's feelings she not, chose not to think about her dharmic feelings so in that sense she acted in a stone hearted way and then she was cursed to become a stone so curses can as i said restrict our kshetra in different ways now the thrust of the story is in the ramayana at least it is not that ahalya was cursed but that ahalya was delivered and how was she delivered after valmiki rishi after uh, vishwamitra rishi told this whole story he said that great ahalya is still here and he pointed to a stone over there that is a solitary stone but on that stone a tulsi was growing so you know sometimes we may might make a mistake and there might be consequences of that mistake but that does not mean all the past good that we have done is lost so now for tulsi to grow on a stone is special and that happened because ahalya was still a good person in one moment of weakness she did some bad thing <laughs> and then ram went there and he touched his feet and as soon as he touched his feet she became transformed the stone gave rise to uh, ahalya manifested to there and she offered her prayers and her gratitude to ram and then ram blessed her and she became elevated she went to a higher destination so she had lived a life of virtue but one wrong act she got the consequence of that but then whatever virtue she had done by that she got elevated so here the point is making is curses and choices so ahalya had a choice when she saw that it was indra who had come there but she made a wrong choice that had a consequence she was cursed but eventually she was delivered so for all of us we all have our consciousness as our foundation for living 
So right now, all of you are conscious, hopefully of the class, <laughs> but you're going to be conscious of many other things also. But the, we have our con consciousness. But we want our consciousness to be developed so that we can become more empathic, so that we can care more, we can understand each other better and ultimately so that we can become conscious of Krishna. So now, some of us may have our consciousness shrunk in a particular way. Some people are very, uh, very rational. They just don't understand people's emotions. Some people are extremely emotional, they just don't understand reason. There are different kinds of people like that. So broadly speaking, whatever is our consciousness, we want to expand that. And Lord Ram's feet touched Ahalya and her consciousness expanded. So the process of Bhakti Yoga is essentially meant to bring our consciousness in touch with the lotus feet of the Lord. It is not just a physical touch. It is more of a spiritual touch where we get transformed. So I will talk broadly about three parts of how we can change our consciousness. But any questions till now? Yes. So uh, again, like, correct me if I am wrong, but I have come across this theory where it says like, you know, if you curse somebody, like for example, a wrong example to give, uh, Prabhu is cursing me. So that means he is using some of his good deeds in like, you know, validating that curse. Like that curse is effective <coughs> only if he had certain good deeds that could transform those words into performance. And same applies with bless blessings as well. In fact, for bless blessing somebody, you require uh, a, a larger load of your good deeds are being utilized for that bless blessing to come into the picture. Is that so or am I misconstrued? Okay, good question. So is it that if we have some good karma, then that is used to bless others. And only if we have some good karma, then that is also used if we curse someone. That also gets... Mm, again, things are subtle over here. It is not just karma alone. There has to be a particular kind of power that is associated with that good karma. So generally speaking, the when we seek blessings or as when we give when, when somebody curses us or somebody blesses us. Now the important thing over there is not necessarily that what they say will come true. That it, the important thing over there is that we are we live in an interconnected world. And in the interconnected world, the attitudes of people towards us affects us. So now how much it will affect us? That will depend on the nature of our relationship, the nature of how much power they have. You see, if I, sometimes <coughs> some people come into a room and say somebody is very quarrelsome, somebody is very disagreeable, and just they, they enter into the room and the whole atmosphere of the room changes. Now, say there is some very domin dominating, demanding kind of boss who comes in and all the team, everybody becomes a tense at that time. So what is happening over there? That if that person just, you know, you do this, you do this, they dominate everyone. Then they create negative vibrations. So it said that some people bring happiness wherever they go. And some people bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> so what happens over here is, that there, that person is attracting negative vibrations. Now those negative vibrations will have their effects. To what extent the effect will be, that will vary from person to person. So we, we don't have to become too worried or too judgmental. Oh, this person has cursed me, this person has done this, this person has done this. So we try to behave in such a way that we don't, that we attract good wishes from others and not bad wishes as much as possible. Yeah, and if somebody has a specific kind of karma by which they can bless or like the curse, then those blessings and curses may have powers. And traditionally, Brahmanas would have that power, and that's why uh, many people would fear the curse of a Brahmana. You know, in the Bhagavatam, some places they said that more than the say the, the the stick of Yama or the Vajra of Indra, I fear the the curse of a Brahmana. So if somebody has, as you rightly said, some kar special karmic powers, then they can 
uh, they can curse, but definitely their power will be depleted if that curse is inappropriate. See, the whole idea is that the universe is reciprocal. Re reciprocal means that if we are interested with some power, if we use it appropriately, we are showing responsibility. Then that power will increase. But if we use it inappropriately, then that power will be diminished. So Vishwamitra, when he was performing tapasya, at that time, Brahma and uh, Menaka came and tempted him. And then he first got allured, then he got angered. And in anger also, when he cursed, he lost his power. So the idea is that when we have power, it needs to be used responsibly. Does that address your question? Yeah. Uh, so, like, you know, that further elevates me from this question to a corresponding um, theory, which is, so any curses given to a person, are th can those be, uh, like, you know, reduced by a good karma if the person performs it? And how, how much is it linked to the person's consciousness of him knowing that he's cursed about that? Okay. We don't want to go into okay. technicalities of curses, but I'll just mention two quick points over here. Mm. Okay, so how much <coughs> does the person's can curse the curses be effect of curses be reduced in some ways, and also how much the person's knowing about the curse, how much does it affect? Right. See, the whole idea is that there is power, and the power is meant for a particular purpose. Mm. Now, from both sides, the person who has the power and then the person whom that power is used, their consciousness matters. Or sometimes, the person who has power, they can abuse it. That happens everywhere today. And the police may have some power, they may abuse it. The politicians may have some power, they may abuse it. So, similarly, the sages or whoever, they had power. Now, the purpose of that power is to, is to deter people from wrong actions. That, that is the purpose of that power. Now, the sages can sometimes lose their temper and use that power inappropriately. Then they are responsible for that. If they use it appropriately, then they are doing their duty. Then they, they, they actually uh, get more empowered by that. Now, on the other hand, just like in a normal situation also, if somebody has committed some mistake, some crime and they are punished. Now, <coughs> the whole reason for having a judge, you know, we could just have a mechanical system, okay, this punishment, okay, this, this uh, crime, this punishment. Uh, they, there is some computer program, I recently read about artificial intelligence and how it can work and how it cannot work. Watson? Yeah. So, they use, in the courts, they use this program to try to decide based on a person's case history. You feed in all the case history and based on that you decide how much punishment the person should be given. So there was a person who had just done some shoplifting and the program gave him like three years in jail for shoplifting. And why was that? Because he had done multiple crimes before. But what that program missed out was that all those crimes were like three, four, five, six years ago. And the last three years, he had lived completely a, a, a crime-free life. And something like what he had taken was a very minor thing. Like, so it was completely disproportionate. And there was appealed and then the court judge said that actually if we had, if I had not used this computer's input, then I would never have used a strong sentence. So the point I'm making over here is that, you know that the curse, when, when a curse is given and a power is to be used, a lot depends on the consciousness of the person. So, if the person is repentant, then the magnitude of the curse can definitely be decreased. So, if the person knows and seeks forgiveness, sometimes the curse may not be fully withdrawn, but definitely the magnitude can be decreased. Okay? Thank you. So, any other questions? Yes. They never misused it, that's why they had the supreme power. Yes. Uh, well, never would be too strong a statement because to err is human. So even the Brahmanas can make mistakes, but generally they would not misuse it. They would be very cautious about using it. And that's how they had that power. So it is said that Shringi, yeah. when he abused that power to curse 
Parikshit Maharaj, although Parikshit Maharaj's fault was very minor. So abuse of power can be not just in terms of just exercising the power, but exercising the quantity of the power also. It's like say, if there is one mosquito that has bitten someone, and that person decides there is mosquito in this house, let's throw a bomb on this house. <laughs> That's ridiculous, isn't it? There's no proportion over there. So to use too much power is also abuse of power. So because he abused that power, from that time it is said that the Brahmana started losing their power. Okay. Thank you. Yes. He sent them on like a, I don't know, it was something that launched him all the way to heaven. And then Indra saw him and he pushed him all the way back. So then, but uh, Vishwamitra made a promise. So he had to create an artificial heaven and then send him there. Hmm. What's so bad about creating an artificial heaven? Okay. <laughs> What's so bad? Because he lost all his powers. Why? Okay, Why okay, yeah. So when Vishwamitra came and created artificial heaven, he lost his power. Why was that? Yeah, so what happens is, there is a cosmic order. There are things which happen in a particular way. Say for example, if you have a place like Harvard. I was just in Princeton. I gave a talk over there. So if you have an elite college, and then in that college, you send a person who doesn't even know basic alphabet and basic arithmetic. It will disrupt the whole class over there, isn't it? So to get into particular places, particular basic qualifications are required. So generally to go to heavens, punya is required. And there is a system of order by which you do punya here and then you go over there. So when Vishwamitra Although Trishanku did not have the adequate punya. And one part of it is that it's not just you have to have piety, it's also that uh, there has to be a certain amount of transformation that happens. People cannot go to heaven and stay in heaven for, for their whole heavenly lifespan in this body. They have to give up this body and get another body and go there. So Trishanku wanted to go in this very body. But that was a disruption of the cosmic order. So when he used his power to send Trishanku up, Indra saw, hey, unidentified flying object coming here. <laughs> and Indra sent it down. And then Trishanku came down, again Vishwamitra sent him up, again he went down. And then Vishwamitra, see it was his abuse of power here that instead of telling, uh, telling uh, Trishanku you do the right punya, you will go to heaven. Like what had happened is Trishanku was a part of the dynasty of uh, which was uh, for which Vashishta was the priest. And he had asked Vashishta, how can I go to heaven? So you do punya, I will do yagyas for you, next life you will go to heaven. He said no, I want to go in this life. That's not possible. Now, Trishanku knew about the rivalry between Vishishta and Vishwamitra. So when he first came to Vishwamitra and he, he did not, he was, in, he was also cunning. He said that I know you are extremely powerful. I know you are more powerful than Vashishta. That you can do that which Vashishta can't do. <laughs> So what happened is, why did Vishwamitra became so invested in Trishanku? Because Vishwamitra always had that, uh, that feeling that, oh, Vashishta is such a powerful sage, I want to be a powerful sage also. So I want to prove my power. So there was no noble motive for that. It was just a, like, you could say one-upsmanship. I want to prove that I am better than him. And because of that, his desire was not in harmony with the cosmic order. So then when he tried to force him there, that, that, that didn't work. So he said, I have given my word, I will create a separate heaven. So now the whole problem with that is that it's like say, as again, I give the example of Harvard or, or Princeton or whatever, Stanford, whatever. 
So then if somebody says, oh, you're not allowed in Stanford, I'll create a separate Stanford for you. <laughs> OK, but do you have the technological facility? Do you have the faculty? Just give a name Stanford over there, and you create it. But then that will disrupt the whole educational system, isn't it? Now in India, they ha we have IITs. And now the government is creating more IITs, which is in one sense good. But then there are many, I was with a professor in IIT Kharagpur, so he was saying that the standard of the IITs is diluting because there are so many IITs and we don't have enough staff to actually take the standard. Of course, there are intelligent people also going over there. But the point is that if you indiscriminately replicate something, then you cannot maintain the standard. So because it was primarily disrupting the cosmic order and it was because it was desired by his, because of his own desire for one of expansion. That's why in doing that, he lost all his power. Okay? Thank you. So let's uh, move on to our discussion. So I was talking about consciousness and how consciousness can become diminished and how it can be elevated. So how can we bring our consciousness in contact with the Lord Lotus feet so that it can also expand. So I'll talk about three eyes. Inclination, intention and intelligence. So basically, see we live as products of our past. We are all products of our past, but we are not prisoners of our past. Our past shapes us. At a very basic level, we have a particular skin color. We have a particular bodily genetics. This is shaped from our past. The parents that we had, the country where we were born in. So the past is always with us. Not just as our physical body, but also as our mental impressions. Now, the, so we say we can say from our past comes our inclinations. So we all all we are all inclined towards certain things. Whenever something happens, we all can interpret it in different ways. I suppose you are doing some service and you are coordinating some other devotees, a volunteer, they are all supposed to do a service and say no, some devotee is supposed to come at a particular time, the devotee doesn't come. Now when the devotee doesn't come on time, we may say, this devotee is so irresponsible. Or we may say that actually nobody takes this service seriously. Or we may say that nobody takes me seriously. <laughs> now what has happened over here? It's the same incident, but different people can interpret it differently. So if a person is very, uh, you could say very judgmental, or very domineering, then that person says, hey, this person is irresponsible. Hmm? If a person is themselves very insecure, whenever anything doesn't happen well, I am useless. I am good for nothing. I am, I am, nobody takes me seriously. So the same action, same situation rather, can be interpreted in a different way by different people. That depends on our inclinations. The inclination that we have, shapes our default reaction. Is that what we call samskaras? Exactly, samskaras, yes. Okay. Now, I cannot go into technicalities here, but broadly, our inclinations have two aspects to it. One is, we can say, now these are again rough English words, impulses and instincts. Impulses are generally unhealthy. Hmm? They are where somebody just has a desire to eat something, buy something, some people are shopaholics, whatever they see, buy it, so shop, 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 shop till you drop, <laughs> it's like that, <laughs> just keep shopping, keep shopping, so that's a, that's an impulse, but along with that there are instincts, instincts means, we could say inst instincts is like programmed intelligence, now some people, they just are so good at something, you know, if they if they have they are good at interior design, at home decoration or whatever, they come into a house and as soon as they see a house, they say, you know, okay, you move the sofa here, you put this plant here, you put this curtain like this, it look good. So somebody might have stayed in that house for six months, they didn't think about it. <laughs> so what some people just have that ability. So 
what happens is this is instinct. So, our impressions, uh, the inclination that we have, some of it can be good also, some of it can be bad also. Like some people just have a gift for music. Some children, just when they are so small, they pick up a kartal, anybody were telling them, they start, start playing it. And they do it quite well. So, these are all inclination. They are what we have got from the past. So, samskaras can be good as well as bad. So, broadly you can say the good samskaras are, are instincts, the bad are impulses. So, now they give us our default reaction. Now, the default reaction does not have to be necessarily what we do, but that is what first comes within us. Now, along with that, we have our intention. Intention means what do I want to do right now? So, for example, say somebody spends a lot of time on social media, maybe watching Facebook, looking at Facebook or YouTube or WhatsApp, and now they are doing some serious work. Maybe they are doing some studying some scripture or reading something for some job or whatever, and then suddenly a notification comes up your friend has updated their Facebook picture. <laughs> oh, let me see it. Just get that desire. And then you see it one picture and then maybe what happens is Facebook doesn't show just one picture, there are so many other pictures also which keep coming. <laughs> and then what may become, one minute can become one hour or sometimes so many hours also can go like that. So basically now what is happening over here, the idea, oh let me just look at this picture. That is coming from the inclination. If somebody has repeatedly browsed like that, what happens? That inclination is there, not the intention. But no, I want to study this. So, what happens is the intention is what we bring into a situation. The inclination is what automatically comes. And navigating these two is the intelligence. Now, the intelligence, now as I said, the inclination need not always be bad. So, just like my, if your intention, is to cook some food and we are cooking the food and then as we are cooking it then we suddenly feel that actually this will not be enough, uh, I have to cook more. Now we, we have planned a particular thing but based on your experience or gut feeling you feel I have to cook more. Now that might be a good in inclination also, you have this, this was what plus planned but we might have more people, people might eat more whatever. So what happens is the inclination can sometimes propose something good sometimes can propose something bad. The intention, sometimes we need to stick to it, sometimes we need to adapt it. The balancing between these two, when to stick to our intention and resist our inclination or when to accept our inclination and change our intention. That balance is done by intelligence. So, intelligence is what now among these three, uh, what is in our control and what is not in our control? What about inclination? Well, very little control, isn't it? It's like the default thing which comes. What about intention? Intention is broadly in control. Intelligence? Very controllable. Yes, you could say that. See, the challenge is that our intelligence is also fluctuating. Sometimes we are wise, sometimes we are otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happens is that, say, if you invest some money in fixed deposit, then if you invested a particular amount, that amount is as it is. But if you invested in stocks, so stocks are also very variable. So you might have fifty thousand dollars one day, and the next day you might have just five hundred dollars. So our intelligence is like what investment, stock. fixed deposit or stock? Stock, stock. stock isn't it? <laughs> one day we are very intelligent, and the other day, what happened? So our intelligence varies. It's not exactly our intelligence varies. But our intelligence is affected by our modes. So the modes change, and sometimes the way we think, we don't have that clarity that is all times. 
So basically, when we now let's go go back to Ahilya's example with these three points. Mm -hmm. So now, yeah. So intelligence by nature is volatile, or is it because the situation changes around you? Many things. It's uh, not. I said our intelligence currently tends to be volatile, but the more we become fixed, the more we become pure, the more we come to sattva, the mode of goodness, then our intelligence also becomes steadier. It becomes steadier. Mm -hmm. As I say, somebody is a recovering alcoholic. Now, when they are, they are when they are strong, determined, I am not going to drink. Then, even if somebody offers a temptation, no, no, they will intelligently move away from there. Even if say they are going from office to home and along the way there is a bar, okay, let me not go along this road. Let me go along that road. Their intelligence is strong at that time. But sometimes, when the desire hits them, then what happens? Then their intelligence just stops working. So, so that's why. You could say that mm, our intelligence varies in our present stage, especially if you are vulnerable to something. Mm, I'll explain this a little bit later. Let's we'll, let's apply this to first earlier story, then we'll apply in our own lives and our other situations. So see, now in the case of Ahalya, as I said, she was a at one level she was a virtuous woman. So there is one inclination within her, which was, you know, she wanted to live a life of virtue. But there is another inclination, which was like her feminine pride. Oh, I am so beautiful. Now she had no plan. She, it was not she who planned. It was Indra who planned the whole conspiracy. It was Indra who came to her at that particular time. So now. At that time, as I said, she had no intention of doing anything wrong on that day. But Indra came over there and a situation came over there and one particular inclination from her past came up, it overwhelmed. And at, at a particular time, she said yes. The intention, she may not have, she said yes and that is how the whole thing happened. So for all of us, when we are going through life, we can't change. Now, in, when you say our inclination, I said there is good and bad inclination also. Both are there, but what we can nourish is our intelligence and our intention. So, broadly speaking, our intelligence is nourished by the study of Shastra, by hearing, studying, contemplating, assimilating. When we do that, our intelligence starts becoming sharper. Sharper means that we can start discerning this is right, this is wrong. Sometimes the intelligence itself becomes confused. But the intelligence is sharp, at least we know this I should not do. And now with respect to our intention, that is shaped a lot by our association. The kind of association that we keep, that determines which desires become our driving desires. So we have many desires within us. When you talk about intention, intention is like a specific desire that we have chosen and we are focusing on that. That has become our intention. So right now you may have any desires. You may have a desire, okay, I am tired, I want to go home and take rest. You may have a desire, oh, I am hungry, when will the facade start? You may have a desire, oh, you know, last one hour I have not checked my phone, how many messages will be there? <laughs> <laughs> so there can be many of these thoughts that are popping up within us. But say if you have come here with this intention, okay, I want to hear this class. Then what happens? You focus on that. So, we have various desires, but the desire that we focus on that becomes our intention. So, for us, which desire we choose to focus on, that is what is determined by, uh, uh, largely by our association. Say, if you are sitting right now, and then you see your neighbor, while hearing the class, they are looking at their phone also. Say, maybe let me also look. <laughs> and then maybe let, let, let me also look. Then you know what the speaker thinks, let me also look. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, our association shapes a lot of our intentions. So by studying scripture, we can strengthen our intelligence. By good association, we can strengthen our intentions. And with respect to our inclinations, we, whatever inclinations good we have, we can nourish them. And whatever inclinations unhealthy we have, we need to weaken them. Now, I will conclude with one last point in this, that when 
we are trying to, we have certain conditionings from the past which push us. Maybe we get angry or we get depressed or we worry, whatever it is, we might have particular conditionings we might have. So now when they come, if we try to fight against them, that is very difficult. Sroto ganas tamaranam bhajabasu devam. The Bhagavatam says, Yat pada pankaja palasha vilasa bhaktya karmashayan gratitam udgratayanti santaha tadvanna rikta matayo etayo nuragad. Sroto ganas tamaranam bhajabasu devam. It says that, Sroto ganas. Just like waves come in an ocean, like that, desires arise within us. Now if a sudden wave has come, if we try to use our strength and our willpower to fight the wave, the wave can be too strong. And to resist that wave is almost impossible. But we do not want to get swept away by the wave, is not it? So what can we do? So if when the wave is coming, if there is an anchor that we can hold on to. So on our own, if I try to fight the wave, the wave is so strong, I will get swept away. And then I may feel, oh, waves are so strong, what can I do? I will get swept away. We may give up. But if that same energy, we focus on trying to hold on to an anchor, then even then the wave will hit us and the wave will shake us. But if we, can, if we hold on to the anchor, we won't be swept that much away. Because the anchor is firm. So for us, each one of us has to discover what is the anchor that can hold us steady. If we keep fighting against the waves of our desires, we will just not only keep losing, but we will keep losing hope also. I just can't do this. So if we think that the waves should not come only, well that is uh, that is, uh, you know, there is optimism and there is, you could say stupidism. <laughs> you know, to think that waves won't come, that is just expecting too much. That's not going to happen. But if you can find an anchor that we hold on to, then still there is a struggle because when the waves come, the waves will push us. But the struggle will be far less strenuous and far more fruitful. We focus on holding on to the anchor. So Krishna is him, the Lord himself is an anchor like that. And he has many, many manifestations. You know, his holy names, Japa, Kirtan, study of Shastra, worship of the deities, doing a particular service to the Lord. That can be our anchor. And the more we train ourselves to hold on to that anchor, what will happen is, the inclinations, the waves may come, but we won't get swept away. And the process of bhakti is not just about doing some ritual. It is about making our mind spiritual. There are, there are activities which people may call as rituals. The word ritual has a negative connotation in today's world. That's why we use the word devotional practices or spiritual practices, not rituals. But the point is that it's not just, oh, I have to do my japa, I have to do some puja, I have to do some offering, I have to come to this satsang, whatever. Yes, these are important, but there's a purpose for this. And the purpose is to make our mind spiritual. Make our mind spiritual means to make our, ourselves anchored in some connection with Krishna that we can hold on to. Now, what that is, broadly speaking, when I say it is the holy name, but Krishna is multi, uh, multi-dimensional. Krishna can manifest in different ways for different people. So for some people it may Shastric study. You know, I just hear some class, I hear this, I, I just feel calm. Some people they just like to recite verses. Oh, I feel some calm. So we have to find out what is our anchor. And focus more on holding on to the anchor, not fighting the waves. And if we hold on to that anchor, then the waves may come, but we will not be swept away by the waves. And ultimately, Krishna is not just an anchor we hold on to in the ocean, but Krishna is also the boat. 
as I said earlier, the waves may not stop, but if we come to the land, the waves may keep going in the ocean, but we will have gone out of that ocean. So Krishna and the connection with Krishna, the process of bhakti yoga, at one level like the anchor, which protects us among the waves, but another level it's also like a boat, and that boat takes us across the ocean of material existence. And then when we come to Krishna's lotus feet, when we come to Ram's lotus feet, then our consciousness blossoms and we become absorbed in him. We eventually attain him. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this topic of curses and choices. So <coughs> curses basically are performative utterances. Because a person has some power, so that utterance leads to some performance. If somebody doesn't have that power, then the performance is just words, is that the utterance is just words, there is no per action that is performed because of that. And in Kali Yuga, we are fortunate that we don't have power to curse. Otherwise, our tongue, which is like a lo constantly loaded gun, even without any power to curse, we can hurt so many people. With that power, we can do so much more damage. Basically, curse means that the, when a person is cursed, their kshetra, their area of influence gets restricted in some way. We discuss five major curses in the Ramayana in different contexts. And uh, we talked deliberately about the mechanism behind curses also a little bit. That there are, we see the mechanism here when the, between the linking the utterance and the performance, but in in the Vedic times, there would be a subtler mechanism which we didn't know about. I talked about the Ahalya story. She was not ex she, was, she was not ex just a victim of lust and anger of two men. Rather, she had a moment of weakness. And she ga got carried away by the heady sense of power. Oh, I am so beautiful. And in that, in that getting carried away that way, she diminished her consciousness. Instead of thinking about her duty and her relationship and dharma, she thought of just that pleasure at that time. And thus, she was cursed. So, similar, <coughs> and when Lord Ram came and touched the lotus feet, she regained her consciousness back. So, for us, we all make choices and sometimes our choices, our consciousness can get diminished. And I talked about butchers, son, ch children, they they may hesitate to kill initially, but then they will start killing nonchalantly because the consciousness gets diminished. So for us, how do we expand our consciousness again? How can we get the Lord Lord to speak to manifest in our hearts? That is, I talk about three eyes. What were they? Intelligence, Yes, thank you. So inclination is what we have got from the past. Some good, some bad. That comes like our default response. Intention is what we consciously strive for. What we, what is the desire among our many desires, which is the desire that we choose and dwell on. And, and intelligence is, which, how do we balance both of these and how do we move forward. So our intelligence is often like a <coughs> stock market uh, investment rather than a fixed deposit. So we can nourish our intelligence by studying Shastra. We can nourish our, we can nourish our intention by good association. And as far as our inclinations are concerned, we talk about, because there are good and bad inclinations, rather than focusing on, because of the bad inclinations, some waves come up within us. Rather than trying to fight those waves, we try to find some good inclination within us, which can help us hold on to a, an anchor. So based on our interest, whether it is musical or whether it is uh, intellectual or whether it is whatever it is, we find out some way we can hold on to Krishna, hold on to the Lord. And once we are anchored, then the waves may come, but we will not get swept away by them. And the process of bhakti, the link with Krishna, is not just an anchor, it's also a boat. We will not only be saved from being swept away by the waves, by holding on to Krishna, we will also be able to get out of this ocean entirely. And that is the perfection of life. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, please. I mean, like you said, Yes, definitely. Yes, it's like, do our present good deeds become our future inclinations? 
yeah every every decision becomes an impression which comes as a future proposition i repeat every decision becomes an impression and that will come as a future proposition say if somebody has repeatedly on their phone visited a particular website say bollywood.com hmm? and then they come to a spiritual program and they hear about bhagavad gita and they want to know what is bhagavad gita and they go and put on their browser bhagavad gita b what happens <laughs> immediately bollywood.com comes up <laughs> so now they their intention was to go to bhagavad gita.com but from the past inclination bollywood came up <laughs> so now if they just let go away the past inclination then bollywood.com will open up us they consciously press bhagavad gita then they go to bhagavad gita.com now if they keep choosing bhagavad gita again and again and again then what will happen is eventually next time that after a few times when they type b both will come and if they keep going to bhagavadgita.com eventually bhagavadgita will come as the auto default auto complete so there is programming within us but we are not our minds are not just programmed machines they are also programmable machines and we can't change what past programming we have right now but by our present actions we can also reprogram okay thank you any other questions or comments yes sir your prashna sagar yes All? Three eyes. All three eyes. Who? 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 Indra. Indra. Okay. 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 How would Indra was like such a role model? How can he be a hypocrite? Because he's a god. Okay. If Indra is a role model, if he's a devotee, then how can he be a hypocrite? By not following the three eyes. So could he not follow the three eyes? Yes. See. <laughs> okay yes you know indra see different people teaches in different ways some people teaches by their example what to do and some people teaches by their example what to not do <laughs> so it's a indra as especially if you see in the bhagavatam uh, he is depicted if you look at the vedas and even the upanishad vedas especially indra is considered a very very powerful person and he is definitely uh, it to become indra is not easy and has to do a lot of punya but the bhagavatam uh, tells those incidents from indra's life generally not in the bhagavatam the bhakti literature even ramayan those incidents when indra goes wrong if you consider the cosmic time span so no, indra there's not just one indra there are many indras and there have been many many universes so most of the time indra functions well but generally for us if we are to learn some lessons it is when somebody does something wrong why did they do that wrong and how can they do it right we learn the lesson from there so indra he has certain tendencies which come from the the privilege and the power that he has so he he does a lot of punya to get to swarga by by his doing his piety he gets to heaven but in heaven his purpose is now okay i did so much punya i did so many yagyas now i want to enjoy so what happens he has certain piety which comes from his past life because he has lived piously but there is that also that enjoying mentality and sometimes that enjoying mentality goes beyond limits so those are times when he can even challenge krishna or he can do some uh, some something wrong so but because overall he is not a demon he is a he is a pious person he is a devta 
so he is he comes back on track so through so the so the bhagavatam or the bhakti literature broadly use indra as an example of how a uh, material opulence is not an insurance from spiritual deviation that just because i am materially wealthy i am materially pious i am materially powerful that does not insure me from the temptation from wrong doing rather because i have that i might do more easily so it's a he is used as an example to teach certain things to us no 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 not at all not at all not at all yeah <laughs> yeah that's true that's that's true because we we as i said in the bhakti literature see every script every book has a particular purpose the purpose of the bhakti literature is primarily to glorify bhakti and indra he is not exactly a bhakta indra there is a difference between punya and bhakti punya is piety bhakti you could say broadly spirituality in punya what is the idea god i'll be good provided you make my life good here so the idea is that in punya people are not interested in god per se or loving god they are interested in what god will provide me here in bhakti they are interested in loving god per se and attaining god's kingdom so in punya how one can do punya and be elevated to a high destination that's what indra demonstrates but in bhakti even the success of punya is considered to be inadequate even if one lives a very pious life what is the result of that you still stay in the material world you still stay in a place where temptation can befall anyone and how a person who has been elevated to heaven can also be dragged down by temptation that is demonstrated through the example of indra so that's the mean that this guna is still free down ah uh, okay that's a good does that mean indra is still rajaguna is predominant i want to say predominant but it does become dominant at times that predominant means it's constantly there indra is virtuous overall as in regarding the point that all the stories you have heard that's true because all the stories we hear are from the bhakti literature but if you read the rigveda there is so much praise of indra that he fought so many demons and he killed those demons and he's a great hero and he has uh, say <coughs> suppose there is a book on say you know cricket yeah. okay <laughs> okay yeah. okay so suppose there is a, somebody has written a book on say leg spin bowling and then they describe how this leg spinner made this batsman out this leg spinner made this batsman out now now that batsman might be a champion batsman <laughs> who has scored a century double century triple century also but in that book on leg spinning bowling all the time you see that batsman getting out only is it it you know no you see this batsman is a fool is all the time gets out <laughs> but the point is not that batsman is bad the point of this book is to show how leg spin bowling can be so expert and then that expert batsman can also get out so like that indra is not a weak person but in a book where is meant to glorify bhakti how somebody who lacks bhakti can be overrun this way that way that way that is affected over there so it's not that indra is constantly in rajoguna but when provocations come when temptations come rajoguna does take over okay <laughs> okay so any last question or shall we stop So thank you very much Shri Prabhupada ki Gaur Bhakt Vrind ki Jai Gaur Pramanande Jai to paad ki such a wonderful class I think uh, it required me a month at least to contemplate all the concepts and you know cultivate that intelligence and intention and all that thank you for